The media also argued that Israel promises that it is determined in defending Turkey against fundamentalistic Islamist movements in the Middle East. And what about facilitating conditions? I'm not going to go into details. The killings of PKK and the speaking of welfare parties. They were the facts uh, on which a military and the media can construct their uh, arguments. What, 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 what about audience? And politics of fear was very, very common uh, during that time. And the military convinced the bureaucrats uh, to make uh, military agreements with Israel. What, what about outcomes? Of course, uh, we, uh, Turkey had many agreements with Israel. Uh, military co cooperation in defense industry and common military exercise. And let's skip to the securitization in the 2000s. The main the securitizing actor was, it has been government uh, during the 2000s. And uh, of course, uh, referent objects uh, like survival of state and secularism has lost their ground during uh, the 2000s because of uh, the facilitating conditions. And you know, the uh, Turkey experienced the demise of PKK assaults and the closure of welfare party, and Syria and Israel uh, has changed their politics against, uh, to Tur against Turkey, and European Union conditioned that Turkey must uh, change civil military relations. And those kind of facilitating conditions make impossible uh, that uh, may make impossible to say that referent objects uh, are under threat. And government also began to criticize the military about the referent objects. Let me give an example. Uh, Mesut Yilmaz, uh, then Deputy Prime Minister, uh, said that the military is using uh, irtija and uh, survival of state a pretext to maintain its power. And uh, many newspaper or uh, functional actors uh, criticize uh, the military about uh, its using uh, such topics as an excuse uh, for its power. And what about the relations of this kind, those things uh, with Israel? Uh, during the signing of agreements, uh, military agreements with Israel in 2002, uh, Mesut Yilmaz, then the deputy prime minister, stated that <coughs> it is better to suspend the signing of project until a solution on the occupation of Palestine was in sight. And main opposition parties, Justice and Development Party and Truth Path Party, called for suspension and cancellation of the deal uh, between Israel and Turkey. And uh, what about uh, functional actors? Cengiz Chandar, uh, who is one of the leading columnists in Turkey, wrote an article in 2000. Uh, in this article, he said that Turkey cannot afford the shame to be number one military partner of the aggressor military machine rising to injure of the region's people in the first days of uh, Al-Aqsa Intifada. And during the tank modernization deal in the 2002, Mehmet Ali Biran, another uh, leading columnist, criticized the military uh, by saying that the signing of the deal is some kind of example of hypocrisy against the Palestinians. And, of course, some civil society organizations directed their criticism against the military uh, during the 2000s. For example, uh, the leader of Education and Personal Labor Union said that we asked the authorities to remove all agreements with Israel. No agreement with a terrorist state is more valuable than, than humanity. And those kind of things can, can be called those kind of things as successful desecretization attempts. I, I don't think so, because some uh, common military exercise 
uh, has been cancelled in 2009, but many military agreements uh, remain uh, um, let's keep to my concluding remarks and I think Turkish-Israel relations cannot be separated from domestic politics and civil military relations in Turkey in the 1990s the relations were used against the rise of political Islam and Kurdish nationalism by the military and in 2000s governments desecretized the relations which gave them a free space to speak on foreign and domestic policy. Please uh, imagine that in the in 1990s the military uh, has had an upper hand in domestic and foreign relations of Turkey. This is not a co coincidence. coincidence. And in, two in 2000s uh, the governments have been an upper hand in domestic uh, and foreign uh, politics of Turkey. And uh, this is a uh, very speculative uh, comment. Can we talk about a new securitization by the government? Because uh, government, the current ruling government uh, often say that Israel is existential a threat for the regional stability. And uh, in the end of the 2010, uh, National Security Council uh, put Israel on the list of uh, threats. And maybe we can call another securitization uh, which uh, developed by the governments in Turkish Israeli relations. Thanks for your question. Thank you very much. I think we listened to three very interesting presentations and analysis and what I'll try to do in my role is discuss them just to be brief so that uh, you guys will uh, have enough time for questions. I think the striking characteristics of all three presentations is their relevance for the contemporary domestic and uh, foreign policy challenges uh, uh, today in Turkey. Obviously, uh, Nick's presentation, although deals with the Cold War and essentially with the 1950s, uh, the striking analogy is with today. And in what sense uh, the Menderes era uh, of the 1950s, uh, which uh, was basically uh, one of the last times when Turkey had a very stable government, uh, a, uh, a populist leader, uh, has similarities with today's AKP. And of course, the context is very different. So uh, I think Nick did a good job in terms of uh, analyzing uh, uh, the contextual difference in terms of uh, the Cold War. This is the heyday of modernization theory, and it's unavoidable that some of the uh, American perception of what's going on in Turkey is very much colored by this uh, rosy, pessimistic, some, some may argue, Polyanish view of modernization theory and how Basically, what Ataturk has achieved is continuing under Menderes, and it may come at the expense of some of the polarization happening in Turkey uh, at the same time. What is interesting, as far as sociology is concerned, I think, in addition to this modernization theory uh, color of American analysis, there is also a healthy dose of Orientalism in the way uh, the discourse is shaped in the United States back then. Uh, it would have been interesting to see what kind of discourse there was uh, in Washington about Turkey uh, during the rest of the Cold War. Nick's paper was essentially about the 1950s, so the 60s, 70s, what kind of analysis emerged about the 1971, uh, 80 interventions uh, would also, I think, contributed, would have contributed to uh, the analytical depth of the paper. Uh, Nick also argued that uh, in the American uh, perceptualization there was no real clash between American values and interests. I think it would help to spell out exactly what are the American interests and values that uh, we are talking about in order to uh, either confirm that there was no uh, clash as far as Turkey is concerned in the 1950s in American policies uh, uh, in terms of values and interests, or in the opposite scenario, if there was a clash, then again, what kind of clash? Uh, I also thought that uh, a very interesting and rich dimension of the paper was uh, the contemporary, uh, the 
the comparison with the contemporary situation where to a certain degree Menderes at the earlier stages was pictured in the Turkish uh, uh, context by the opponents of Menderes as a dangerous reactionary, although the, especially the American ambassador probably begged to differ because of his sympathies for modernization theory and what, what he was achieving, but that once this theory of Islamization was not really uh, resonating, the switch was towards authoritarianism, that it basically, that the real threat was not Islamization, but authoritarianism of the uh, uh, Democrat Party. And here too, today, we have the similar situation. I think it is becoming harder and harder to argue that AKP is following a really Islamist domestic foreign policy. But what we see today in the context of Erdogan and AKP, similar to uh, 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 Menderes back then, is that it's not really uh, uh, Islamization, but authoritarianism, creeping authoritarianism uh, against the press, against freedom of association, freedom of thought. Those are, again, very interesting contextual analytical uh, uh, elements. So I, I commend the paper on, its, uh, uh, on these qualities. Uh, Matt and Ryan's paper is very interesting in terms of their uh, analysis of access theory and autonomy theory. This has been the burning issue in Turkey, and I think it's very relevant also in terms of uh, how Washington sees Turkey. I think for a very long time, there was a certain belief that this axis shift was the norm in Turkey, that Turkey was distancing itself from uh, the, the West, and that AKP was the main agent of this uh, uh, distancing, that AKP was the culprit in terms of uh, uh, Turkey being lost or Turkey uh, driving itself away from the, from the West. Uh, their focus methodologically is on public opinion. And I think it makes sense to look at the voters' profile and to, to try to analyze whether voters for the AKP do actually want such a uh, uh, divorce from the West or such a distancing on access shift from the West. And I think for those of us who follow Turkish politics, it's no coincidence that this is not the case. In fact, uh, most of the uh, 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 conspiratorial uh, views about the West in terms of the West helping moderate Islam in Turkey, the West helping Kurdish nationalism in Turkey, comes essentially from more secular Kemalist circles that are closer to the CHP. So it's not that uh, uh, surprising for uh, at least someone like me who always saw that there was a kind of paradox emerging in Turkey in terms of Turkey's identity cleavages. Uh, the paradox is that normally you would think that a political party, a vision associated with the founder of the Republic, Ataturk, uh, and Kemalism, uh, would be always pro-Western, would want the West uh, uh, as for Turkey's vision. Uh, but uh, things really changed after AKP's coming to power, uh, and this clash of civilization dimension in the West, especially after 9-11, changed the tables in Turkey in terms of putting uh, AKP at the driver's seat in terms of being the party that defies the clash of civilization as a party that has Islamic roots but that also accepts secularism, pro-Western foreign policy, European Union, good relations with the United States versus the Kemalist party that is increasingly suspicious of the European Union, increasingly suspicious about the, the United States in terms of the support that the AKP is receiving. To this day, I think we cannot have a conversation in Turkey without uh, 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 some people arguing immediately that there is an American plot to help moderate Islam in Turkey, be it in the form of the Gulen community or AKP, that basically this moderate Islam, the rise of Islam in Turkey is a project cooked up in the United States. So in that sense it confirms some of these uh, uh, beliefs that, that we have, and I think it's also important to emphasize that what we see is basically the autonomization of Turkish uh, foreign policy. That's about independence, that's about self-confidence, that's about sovereignty, and perhaps the most uh, interesting dimension of their paper is uh, uh, the emphasis on the uh, cohesive political culture of Turkey. The, the, the differences between political parties are not that strong in terms of uh, uh, their, their attitude. So there is a Turkish political culture uh, independent of really the CHP, AKP, or MHP. And that's essentially the most important common denominator of this Turkish political culture is a strong sense of attachment to independence, sovereignty, and nationalism. 
And those are traits, I think, that, uh, that in a way, uh, unite both uh, what sometimes is called the kind of neo-Ottoman camp, the pro-AKP camp, or the Kemalist camp. Because both the neo-Ottoman camp and the Kemalist camp value Turkish nationalism, value Turkish sovereignty, value Turkish uh, 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 independence and a sense of Turkish uh, uh, grandeur, a uh, new kind of sense of uh, uh, belief that Turkey should uh, be a leader in the region. Those are characteristics that are shared by both Kemalists and the Ottomans. Here, if I can just pitch my own idea, lately I've been referring to a phenomenon of Turkish Gaulism, comparing basically uh, Turkey to France in terms of its uh, political culture. I think Gaulism in Turkey is a concept that is uniting both uh, Neo-Ottomans and the Kemalists, and Turkish Gaulism is essentially, is like uh, France in the 1960s, 70s, about uh, independence, about a sense of grandeur, about uh, confidence, uh, and occasionally defying the superpower, the kind of hegemonic order, and going for Turkey's own foreign policy. And that's, I think, uh, something that I can also see in their paper, which confirms in my opinion, uh, this kind of autonomy theory overlaps with what I try to call in my analysis Turkish Gaulism. Finally, Ali's paper about securitization, uh, Turkish-Israeli relations, uh, is absolutely right that the 1990s was a decade when everything was securitized in Turkey. In fact, what, what we call the zero conflict uh, uh, policy of Davutoglu today, what Davutoglu calls zero conflict, is basically something that is built against is the antithesis of this securitization of the 1990s. What AKP managed to achieve, in great part thanks to the fact that the context has changed uh, with the 21st century, in great part thanks to the fact that the PKK uh, leader was no longer in Syria, that relations with Greece had changed, is a kind of desecuritization of the Turkish foreign policy. The zero conflict uh, 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 policy is in great part a product of this desecuritization. The interesting analysis here uh, is that as Turkey uh, desecuritized its overall foreign policy with the neighbors, with the zero problem, uh, zero conflict uh, policy, it started to experience problems with uh, uh, Israel uh, because the relationship with Israel in great part, as Ali argued, was based on this securitization. If you want to have good relations with Syria, if you want to have good relations with Iran, you're bound to have some problems with Israel. Uh, you cannot have uh, uh, a zero conflict foreign policy with your neighbors while you're trying to continue the kind of security-based partnership with, with Israel. That's the, that was the weakness of uh, perhaps the uh, heavily military-to-military -military dimension of Turkish-Israeli relations. So in that sense, his contribution also uh, to a certain degree self-evident uh, as a product of uh, uh, the desecuritization de of Turkey, Turkish foreign policy, you had also a securitization dimension uh, problematic with, uh, with, with Israel. I'll just stop here and be uh, happy to, to uh, let uh, the three uh, uh, contributors to perhaps elaborate a little more or answer the questions from the audience. Thank you. Not only to consider domestic politics dynamics, but also uh, sort of threats to identity, uh, to societal security, in a sense. Um, so I was wondering to what extent you think that you could apply securitization theory in a domestic context to the Kurdish issue? Um, and if so, if you think this is applicable, what do you think the prospects of the AKP's attempts to desecuritize this issue? So if this has been sort of made a speech act by the military, what do you think the prospects of the AKP's uh, attempts to desecuritize this particular problem may be? Others? Um, about this issue about... Can't hear you. Oh, is it good now? All right, so about this issue about the fear that Erdogan's party could lead to Islamism, or that it could go east or west. I think we all agree here that actually Erdogan is a very skillful politician being able to keep a balance that benefits the country. And I also think that he can keep a balance that 
benefits the region. However, the party itself isn't, it's based on Erdogan, but I, I would like to ask, do you think that he can be adeptly replaced, that a following prime minister who comes from his party but is not Erdogan can keep this balance that he has kept? Or could it be that the AKP, and it does have a creeping authoritarianism sometimes, which I see a bit, that they could establish the foundations for something even that he would not want? Uh, you know, the Kurdish party, there is a Kurdish party in Turkey. I think uh, it is uh, one of the main uh, desecratizing actor uh, of Kurdish problem. And uh, his criticism against uh, uh, the system or against the state uh, is more stronger than, uh, stronger than the Justin and Development Party. And of course, the uh, Justin and Development Party has the power uh, to change something uh, by desacralizing uh, the Kurdish problem. But uh, there is some hesitation uh, among the uh, members of Justice and Development Party because of uh, this uh, it's a competitive party for the elections. Uh, that's why uh, this, uh, the, the current desacralization of Kurdish problem uh, is not as good as uh, the securitization of Turkish Israeli relations. I, I couldn't hear the second question exactly. That's why. Like, uh, yeah. you could hear that? Could, could it be, I think it was, could Erdogan, like, be a successor, be authoritarian? So I'll attempt to answer the second question, and if anyone here wants to expand on it and contradict my answer, that's fine. Uh, so your question was basically, could Erdogan be replaced? Um, and, and any answer that I give, to that specifically would be pure speculation as far as um, you know someone's charisma or unifying power, I think it would depend on the individual. Uh, but the gist of your question is, would it make any difference in terms of policy if it, if it was a different individual in that place? And I think, um, as the discussant pointed out, one thing that you see from, from the survey data that we analyzed is, is a great degree of cohesiveness between political parties and, and even within the AKP. Um, so I think in terms of foreign policy, uh, any change that you get in terms of an individual would still be uh, responsible to the, the beliefs of the electorate. And so I, I think the, the developments that you're seeing in terms of autonomy, in terms of foreign policy, are going to continue for a long time to come. Other questions? Actually, for an event like this going all day long, no mention was made for the upcoming elections. My question is to Amir Tashmanar. I mean, it also reflects the situation in Turkey, because there's no excitement in Turkey about this upcoming elections. There's no excitement elsewhere. Maybe people consider it as a technical thing. But once we realize the candidates list being uh, in public, we see CHP making a lot of change in their list, and MHP not changing very many lists. But both opposition parties, they are trying to create a space for them as a center rightist role. Is this the only alternative to Erdogan and our party's policies in Turkey? In other, in other words, is, why is there no left wing in Turkey? Uh, why, <coughs> you're right that there is a overall shift towards the right in Turkey and uh, there is a long literature about the, the, the absence of the disappearance of the left in Turkey. And the, I think the stronger part of the literature refers to uh, basically the fact that the left uh, overall in the world uh, uh, has a harder time to, 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 to adapt itself to uh, questions of inequality, to the role of the state. Uh, the only way the left is able to provide alternatives is by approaching itself to the center. What we have seen in the form of Tony Blair or, or uh, Bill Clinton in the 1990s was this kind of uh, very pro-capitalist, uh, pro-center, uh, pro-market left emerging. In Turkey, the literature often refers to the role of the 1980 military coup in terms of uh, crushing the left. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think that the AKP, uh, AK Party, has a uh, certain natural advantage in the sense that 
usually constituencies that should vote for the left when you think about it are lower middle class constituencies. And in Turkey, lower middle class constituencies vote for AKP. Lower middle class urban, urban poor uh, in uh, Gecekondo areas, in shanty towns, overall benefit from AKP's uh, uh, social uh, and economic policies. Something that is under the radar that we don't discuss very much in Turkey how, is how successful AKP has been in terms of changing the health system, for instance, in Turkey. And uh, people who benefit from this new health system uh, uh, are often those who uh, are lower middle class. So this is a party that has managed to deliver socioeconomic services. If a party which comes from the right, a conservative party, that has not left much room in the left for a left-wing party to emerge. And the CHP has the dilemma of all Turkish left-wing parties that it is essentially an elite party. It's a party that represents the state elite, the kind of westernization ideals of uh, Kemalism. And in many ways, there is a certain disconnect, an elite disconnect between this uh, urbanized, uh, urbane left, educated left in Turkey, and religion and uh, the masses and conservative values. So it is very hard for the CHP to, to go out and uh, uh, <coughs> adopt a left wing, a, a left oriented uh, uh, economic agenda. They may talk about ongoing income disparity in Turkey. Turkey has huge income disparity, but again, growth is the best answer to income disparity. Income, the Gini coefficient in Turkey is diminishing in terms of income disparity, and it is happening under AKP. So the uh, long answer to your question is that uh, AKP is not just a conservative party, it is also a party that follows a kind of social democratic uh, populist economic policy that is targeting uh, the Gece Kondus, that is targeting the downtrodden, the, the lower middle classes, and doesn't leave enough room for the CHP, neither on the left, nor on the right in terms of its policies. So it is becoming a cat, what political scientists refer to as a casual pol political party. This is why you're absolutely right. There is no sense of excitement about what's going to happen in the elections. We all know the result. It's, I mean, the, the question is whether AKP will get 45% or 50%. And uh, the suspense about CHP is whether it's going to get 25 or 30%. That doesn't make a lot of excitement in terms of what's going to happen. The MHP, on the other hand, uh, uh, is the big question, and I think lately we know that they're going to be above the 10% uh, uh, threshold, so we're not likely to have a two-party uh, uh, parliament, which is likely to be represented in the, in the new Turkish parliament, and I think this is a <coughs> development for a country that is facing the Kurdish problem. I think the constituencies that MHP represents are real, genuine, nationalist constituencies that should have a voice in the parliament and in the drafting of the new constitution. Question over here. We have one down as well. Turkish and Israeli relations have uh, hit a permanent point, low point of no return. Um, uh, are we headed into a cold war of sorts? Uh, also, um, or on the other hand, with a pattern of sort of Turkish foreign policy pragmatism that we've seen sort of translate into an eventual rapprochement, and what would that hinge on? And did you have anybody you wanted to address that to, or the panel as a whole? Um, I think maybe Ali or uh, and then it, or anyone else in the panel who. Okay, great. And we all have a second question down here in the second row. I'm 
finish of my presentation, I ask a speculative question. And is, can we talk about another securitization by, by the government? And this question has, uh, has a side uh, of reality, I think. And if we, if we have securitization in the future, and our relation with Israel uh, will not turn back uh, the level of, of times. And another uh, answer uh, for this question is maybe uh, about you can be that. And you know, uh, in Israel there is a very conservative government. If this conservative government government will change in, in the near future. And then securitization uh, attempts will maybe collapse in Turkey. And uh, Turkey and Israel maybe will have, uh, will have a, another good uh, relationship in the, in the near future, maybe. And it is, it is not easy to talk about the future. question of the presidential system. I think this question is likely to polarize uh, in the near future uh, Turkish politics. After the elections, I hope that uh, AKP will not spend its political capital on uh, trying to change the constitution and to add basically elements of a presidential system to the constitution because this is likely to polarize Turkey unnecessarily. Uh, you are all familiar with the fear in at least 30% of Turkey, that Turkey is becoming more authoritarian. A, a presidential system, obviously, which will be unavoidably uh, uh, perceived as tailor-made for Erdogan, will create even more alarm and panic among the 30% of Turkey who would not vote for him and unnecessarily polarize the country at the time when Turkey needs depolarization in order to solve the real problem that is facing Turkey, which is the Kurdish issue. The number one issue in Turkey is the Kurdish problem. And at the time when all the political capital needs to be spent on a new constitution that should focus on the citizenship dimension, on the question of minority issues, on the question of uh, how the new constitution can reflect uh, a, uh, a peaceful uh, solution to the Kurdish issue, I think the presidential debate is likely to unnecessarily polarize Turkey. One can also argue that Turkey has a de facto presidential system anyway. The prime minister is in charge. Personalities drive Turkish politics. And when you have a strong personality like Özal as prime minister, or as Menderes, as we have heard from Nick's presentation, you have a de facto presidential system because Turkish political culture is already very much leader-driven. And there is a kind of cult of personality. You obey the, pers you obey the leader of the party, the party of the leader has strong personality and strong majority, uh, can easily establish it some kind of de facto presidential system. So in that sense, I don't find it uh, 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 as a major threat to Turkey in terms of authoritarianism. It already fits the models. What would happen, however, when you have coalition governments and a presidential system? Because AKP is not likely to run Turkey forever. Sooner or later, an alternative will have to emerge to AKP. And remember the 1990s when we had coalition governments. How would coalition governments function in a presidential system? So those are thorny questions, and I hope we won't have to deal with them at the time when, in the next six months, we will have to deal with the Constitution. Right. We have a gentleman back here in the sixth row. Uh, my question is for Mr. Danford. Um, I found your talk riveting. Um, if I heard you right, the Turkey of 1950s was at best grappling with a democratic experience. If you were to compare it with today, 2010, uh, what has changed and what has remained the same? And there's another question right behind. Hi, Ilhan Tanif from Great Daily News and Watan. Actually, I just want to follow up as well, and I'd like to ask Nick if, uh, if you had the chance to look at these latest cables from WikiLeaks, do you see any kind of, uh, can you pinpoint that the you know, same 
Orientalism or uh, looking at things while uh, considering Turkish policy. Do you see any kind of similarities and can you share with us? And actually I can ask a couple of questions to Dr. Tashpınar as well. Uh, Gullism, Turkish Gullism, uh, I wanted to ask, did, as you know, uh, French and uh, American uh, culture background is very much similar to each other, but on the other hand, Turkey has very different historic and cultural differences. If you factor in these uh, cultural differences, do you think that might be uh, that might make a difference in this comparison? And the second is, uh, you talk about uh, how the secular part of uh, segment of Turkey always believed in a uh, conspiracy theory, which I fully agree with you. In these uh, latest months or years, do you think is this a kind of a change is happening and uh, a specific uh, example when we look at CHP is coming to Washington for the first time in the history and they talk about you know uh, freedom and all that. On the other hand, we see AKP officials uh, keep uh, uh, clashes with the uh, Western uh, authorities. Thank you. <coughs> linear progress from tradition to modernity, and by the same token, a linear progress from uh, non-democracy to democracy. As a result of that, I think looking both today and at the 50s, people want to see people want to see the countries either moving towards democracy or away from democracy. They want to identify every party as either promoting democracy or resisting democracy. Whereas, in fact, I think in both cases, what you see is that. Progression is much more like a sailboat tacking to move in a certain direction, and that any given party may move Turkey towards democracy in a number of ways, but then might also, through other policies or through decisions that it takes, once it feels like it's gotten too powerful, also move Turkey away from democracy in other ways. And I think a greater awareness of this, less of an insistence of boiling things down to the good Democrats and the bad anti-Democrats, would make people see the situation in a great deal more nuanced way. Uh, in regards to the question about Orientalism today, I think it's certainly a different kind of Orientalism. What I think has struck me is this tendency to try to historicize or historicize a lot of issues in Turkey or put them in an identity-based context when they don't necessarily deserve to be. I don't know if anyone else read the recent New Yorker article about Besiktas. It began by noting that Besiktas was playing against Bursa Spor, which the uh, author described as coming from the city of Bursa, a former capital of the Ottoman Empire. Which is an interesting, in the very first sentence, to mention this, you know, not Bursa, the automotive center, center of automotive manufacturing in modern Turkey, not Bursa, famous for its peaches and pickles, Bursa, the first Ottoman capital. Uh, it's, it's an insistence on seeing, and I think this goes along with the insistence on seeing anything Turkey does in the Middle East is somehow neo-Ottoman. You know, the fact that if Turkey improves its relations with Syria, that's somehow seen in this historical Ottoman context. Obviously, if Germany improves, if German companies open uh, outlets in Poland, if Germany improves its relations with France, no one calls this neo-Nazism. The idea would be almost offensive. Um, the willingness to essentialize, to historicize Turkish policy is, I think, in some ways a holdover of this Orientalism. Got time for about one or two more. Uh, on this question of, of neo-Ottomanism, uh, I, I, I think neo-Ottomanism is not a very orientalist concept uh, in the way it is used by Western circles. Uh, in fact, when Western uh, analysts refer to neo-Ottomanism, uh, it's not really in a kind of uh, uh, tacitly racist or cultural terms, but more about Turkey coming to terms with its history, Turkey coming to terms with its identity. It's a kind of post-Kemalist situation, which which assumes that post-Kemalism unavoidably will have some elements of pre-Kemalism, before Kemalism. And in that sense, I wouldn't really equate, I, I, I would sl slightly differ from you, Nick, in terms of thinking that Neo-Ottomanism has this Orientalist tone in it. Uh, overall, I think it's more or less value-free and more, more of a kind of 
analytical uh, observation of Turkish foreign policy, which, of course, if you're on the receiving end, if, if you're Syria, if you're Greece, there is this fear that it may be perceived as an imperial foreign policy. I think this is why Davutoglu strongly rejects the term, although occasionally I think he made the mistake of referring to an Ottoman Commonwealth uh, or talking about basically how the British Commonwealth exists and we should compare it to that. Even that did not really create much sympathy. Uh, if you're Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Syria, you don't want to be in the kind of neo-Ottoman provinces of Turkey. That, that creates a sense of arrogance and grandeur that uh, I think uh, wisely he, 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 he rejects. On the two questions addressed to me about goldism, I would argue that there are strong characteristics of similarity between French and Turkish political culture. Uh, look, the Turkish model, this famous Turkish model that we're talking about, is modeled after France. Our understanding of citizenship in Turkey is totally based on an assimilation-oriented citizenship, denying hyphenated identities, denying multiculturalism, denying communitarianism, just the way the French and Jacobin Republic wanted to create a seamless relationship between the citizen and the republic. So Ataturk was a great admirer of the French Revolution, and the notion of Turkish citizenship, this, I, this emphasis on assimilation, uh, uh, and with a strong dose of civic dimension in it, not ethnic, but the idea that Kurds can become Turkish, that we're not going to scrutinize ethnic identity and figure out who's Kurdish and deny the Kurds basically upward mobility. All we ask from the Kurds is to become Turkish, to identify with Turkishness, which is exactly what France uh, asked from the Breton, from the Basque, from the Normand, in terms of their own identity, to show basically loyalty to the Republic. You're French. We don't care about your sub-identity, your religious identity. And there too, I think, there's a similarity. Uh, Turkish model as far as secularism. Turkish secularism is very different than Anglo-Saxon secularism. There's this whole literature comparing <coughs> Turkish secularism as a Jacobin, anti-clerical, uh, militant, uh, uh, secularism. Our secularism in Turkey is very much influenced, inspired by French laïcité. In fact, French laïcité de combat, laïcité which is basically the old style of the laïcité of France of the Third Republic when there was this very much culture war between the church, the Catholic Church and the Republic. So there are similarities between France and Turkey in terms of the kind of political project of Kemalism and the French Republic and also there are similarities on the emphasis on sovereignty. There is an imperial legacy in France. There is an emphasis on uh, the near abroad, France relations with Africa uh, uh, has a level of colonial identity in it. Turkey does not have a colonial type identity with the Middle East, but I think there is a kind of imperial legacy which is reviving now. When Turks talk about the Middle East to, to, to Westerners, to Europeans and to, to Americans, the first thing they say is that we are from this region, we know this region, we rule these lands for 400 years. And there, too, you sense a kind of imperial grandeur in the Turkish narrative. Uh, your second question about uh, the new CHP uh, shedding maybe some of its uh, anti-American uh, traits, uh, one can only wish. I mean, what, what, it remains to be seen. In fact, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu did not come to Washington. I think he should have. Uh, in order to show that uh, he's beyond this kind of neo-nationalist Ulusalcı hang-up, that basically uh, going to America is uh, going to uh, the lion's den and uh, and basically uh, feel, feeding the argument that if you go to Washington, that that proves that you are like AKP, that you you want to distance yourself from AKP on the grounds that AKP is a made in the United States project. This moderate Islam is made in the United States. We are not. We are different. I think deep down there is still this uh, identity dilemma of the new CHP. They want to be less anti-Western, uh, but less anti-Western in their context translates to less anti-EU, not less anti-American. I think they're still quite anti-American in their approach, but they're less anti-EU now. They basically want to show that they have a different uh, approach to the European Union. I think they've been, he's been to Brussels, for instance, and he is willing to go to Brussels. And uh, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. One, if he went to Brussels, one one can hope, hope that he will come as the opposition leader next year, sometime uh, to to Washington as well. Washington needs to see that there is, in fact, a, a, a an alternative, a, a, a viable 
rational alternative to AKP. One of the most important deficiencies of uh, Turkey, Turkey's perception is this weakness of the opposition. And it would really help the people to see that in Turkey there is actually an opposition leader who has rational projects, who answers questions in a rational way, who doesn't buy into the conspiracy theories about the United States. We haven't seen that yet from the new CHP. Are we safe to assume that you're making a prediction as to who that opposition leader will, will be in it's a wild with definitive terms? I'll take a wild guess I, and I will assume that the CHP will be in opposition. There we have it. Uh, we can all remember this uh, in the very near future. <laughs> Well, please join with me in thanking this panel. I think it's been very informative and, and very interesting. I have been charged with uh, giving the concluding remarks, uh, which is nice because I don't really have to move and I'll, I'll stay right where I am. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for coming. Um, I think this has been um, terrific uh, day and uh, without you all it would not exist. Um, secondly, I would like to thank all of our panelists and discussants. Uh, it's been lively. We've covered a wide range of topics and um, certainly Turkey continues to be in whatever manifestation we're looking at. Um, a fascinating uh, country and a fascinating culture um, and uh, one that continues to Garner, I think, more and more uh, in the way of interest globally as well as study. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, my friends at SETA, in particular NU, and uh, my, my good friend from not only here but from Colombia as well, Kadir, as well as the rest of the SETA team, um, as well as Ibrahim Kalin, who was not here today and had to fly back yesterday. Uh, but the what SETA has done here in Washington, I think, has been uh, absolutely terrific in the field of Turkish studies and bringing people together. And it's really a marvelous job and to be commended. Um, I, I don't see Jemil, but I, I would also like to thank uh, Jemil Aydin and uh, also draw attention to the fact that he has put together a really dynamic uh, uh, program across the river at George Mason University, which is um, something to be applauded uh, in a very large way. Uh, today we've looked at a number of facets of, of, uh, of Turkey, and uh, I'm glad to see that, uh, that we have scholars who are, are younger scholars, and scholars who are not only from Turkey, but from the United States as well. Um, just so you know, uh, my first contacts with Turkey began in 1958. And Nick has been kind enough to uh, spill the beans, which was the, the cable about uh, Menderes and the sacrifices and all that was written by my father. Um, so uh, that sort of dates me. Um, and that uh, as in my position uh, currently as the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies, uh, I see and, and my primary job is trying to assist in the development of Turkish studies within the United States. And I have to confess, a number of years ago, I was in Ankara, not one of my favorite places, having grown up in Istanbul. Uh, but uh, I was uh, invited, commanded, uh, to come over to Bilkent uh, and um, give a, a very, sort of on very short notice, uh, a, a talk in one of Metin Heber's classes. So I'd been dragooned into this, and I'd had about half an hour to think about this. And I'm in the car heading out towards uh, Bidkent, thinking of some topic that could be remotely interesting. And so I came up with, I thought, a pretty good ad-libbed talk. And it had to do with the Turkish-American, or I should say, the, the intellectual balance of trade deficit between Turkey and the United States. Namely, uh, nowadays, uh, the vast majority, or at that time, the vast majority of the really cutting edge scholars were coming from Turkey, um, speaking obviously Turkish fluently, but in English as well. Um, and the, you know, here in the United States, we lacked this new rising contingent of scholars. 
Um, I think the panel today, or the panels today, reflect that we are beginning to close this gap, which is terribly important. Uh, if you look back in the history of, of um, scholarship on Turkey, uh, and we go back to, say, the emergence of modern Turkey, which is um, sort of an early benchmark of Turkish studies and probably the most teleological book ever written, um, we don't find a whole lot of uh, people who were non-Turks who were writing about, um, and fluent in Turkish, who were writing about uh, Turkey and Turkish-American relations and the like. And I'm very glad to see that this conference and other ITS, the work that we try to do there, is producing a whole new generation of young scholars. And this is a, this is a tremendously important uh, thing, not only that these scholars will come into academe, but they will also go into state. Um, they will provide better nuance and a deeper understanding of Turkish-U.S. relations. So um, I would like to uh, applaud all of those uh, younger scholars, and I, I would hope that this will continue to grow out and uh, that the number of younger people in American universities um, would, would continue to grow so we get to the point where the scholarship is sort of commensurate with the importance of Turkey. Uh, I think that this is a, an absolutely crucial thing. It's exciting. I hope you all keep involved with this. Uh, I hope that you all contact ITS and, and as well as SETA and continue to uh, contribute to their really excellent literature. Um, so I, I think going forward, uh, it's, it's extremely important. This is very uh, crucial, and I, I congratulate you all. And I should just do one last thing, which is give a big old shout out to my assistant, Derek Fox, who helped hear this today as well. So thank you all very much. Do, do you want to make a closing remark? Or? In which case, how do you? Uh, to pull this off. Hopefully, please give us your um, recommendations, suggestions, critiques, and let's argue, fight over ideas about how to um, better understand Turkey, U.S. relations, and Turkish foreign policy. That's kind of our focus. And David has a secret agenda that, you know, he wants all Americans to learn about Turkey and become experts, right? Not so secret. <laughs> Not so secret now. So really, thank you for uh, coming here and joining us. And uh, thanks.